Welcome to the Lentil Intervention Podcast, talking all things movement, whole food nutrition and environmental wellness with your hosts, Ben and Emma. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 24 of our podcast. My name is Ben Alderwood, coming to you from Auckland and from Boona, Emma Strutt. Hello, Emma. G'day, g'day, Ben. How are you? You're very good, thank you, and uh, really looking forward to our next conversation. Um, I guess barring the very last episode, a lot of our more recent podcasts have been dealing with a lot more in-depth facts and state of where the planet is and can be quite heavy. And uh, I think, you know, we tend to forget that we've had some phenomenal guests talk about these um, their amazing stories of personal journeys and um, you know, improvements of health and, and all that kind of good, feel good stuff. And um, this is going to be one of those episodes. Yeah, absolutely. A bit more positivity on the airwaves today. <laughs> um, so today we have Chef Adam Guthrie joining us. He's the founder of the I Feel Good program. And he has a really inspiring story that I'm sure he will love to share. So I won't give too much away in the introduction. But long story short, like many of us, Adam was leading a very busy life, not paying too much attention to his health, and this all came to a head in a major way at age 39. Now, since then, he's overhauled his diet, changed his lifestyle, and has most definitely regained his health, and now helps and inspires others all around the world to do the same through his platform, I Feel Good. So, Adam, thank you so much for joining us. I know you stay incredibly busy with that program of yours, so we really appreciate you spending some time with us today. Uh, My pleasure. Good to see you, Emma, and you, Ben. Nice to meet you. And, um, yeah, what would you like to know? What would you... Well, I think the very first thing we've got to say is thank you so much for um, being indoors because you're in Byron Bay. As I've mentioned, one of my favorite beaches. Uh, how's the surf looking today? <laughs> I actually haven't gone and checked it today. <laughs> Shame on you. I, Shame on you, Adam. I have been to the gym. I have been to the gym and done, done a weight training session. So um, I had a lot, of, a lot of appointments this morning. I had a TV interview this morning and now I've got you guys. <laughs> That's exciting. Yeah, it was. So um, on uh, Ticket TV, which is a business channel. And okay. we just they just pulled me in for a little interview. Excellent. My first debut on TV. Oh, ah, okay. When does it air? Give us the inside scoop. It, it's been. It was live. It was oh, it's live. It was live. Okay. So you can it was on. <laughs> <laughs> it sure was. But yeah, so living in Byron Bay, I've been up here for about. Uh, we've been here four or five years, and we came here from Bali. Uh, we spent three years in Bali, and. Before Bali, we were in Berry on the New South Wales south coast and just south of Sydney, about two hours south. And that was my hometown. That's where I grew up, which was a beautiful little country town. When I grew up there, it was just um, dairy cows and you know, a few hundred people. And now it's very different. It hasn't grown much. It's probably got about 2,000 people now, but it's a very different demographic. It's like this lifestyle weekend, a place for Sydney and you know a lot of holiday homes and and I got to do my apprenticeship as a chef there in Berry, uh, at a at a restaurant that was consistently in the Sydney Morning Herald Good Food Guide back in the 80s. We were in it 10 years in a row. It was one of the best restaurants in Australia, and it was French. It was called The Baker and the Bunyip. Um, it's no longer there anymore, obviously, but um, it was incredible because back then we were we were actually we were trained under French chefs, and we did everything paddock to plate like literally the local farmers would bring in you know blueberries and raspberries and a whole pig and a whole goat and ducks and eggs and whatever arrived on our door um, on a Wednesday afternoon we'd create a menu out of so and we did everything from scratch so it was a really good place to learn so I've got a nice background there to um, start my career as um, with food and Mm -hmm. Little did I know I'd end up doing this. I left the food industry for a while. I've had a couple of cafes and a couple of restaurants. And um, I left that to go into my family business, which is a real estate um, agency in Berry in Kangaroo Valley. And, um, and little did I know I'd be back to food one day. But now it's always plants. There's no meat in there, no animals. <laughs> oh, butter. I'm sure you learned to love butter, being trained under fresh, uh, French chefs. <laughs> butter and cream. I was going to say, yeah. Sugar. The richness, the richness of French cuisine. 
Yeah, yeah, super rich. Yeah. <laughs> and so, cheese. So tell us a little bit more about that kind of lifestyle. I mean, um, you know, we can already see where the fa- some of the foundations, you know, in terms of your love for food and, and prepping food and, and presenting. But you worked ridiculous hours. Lifestyle-wise, you weren't looking after yourself, were you? Yeah, like when I went into real estate, it's incredibly ridiculous hours, worse, worse than chefing, really, because it's like it's literally seven days a week, 24-7. You're never off this phone. It's always attached to you. You're always responding. You're always on call, basically, because, you know, you're working for the owner who's selling their home, and if you're not taking the phone call from buyers, you're not doing your job right. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it became really, really busy, and I was very fortunate. I became quite successful at that, and... But because you're on the go all the time, running a business, um, and you're in the car a lot, you know, you'd pull into a service station and fill up, and I'd walk out with a packet of chips, you know, a large iced coffee move, a chocolate bar, a couple of them, picnic were my favourite. <laughs> <laughs> I'd grab those, and then, you know, lunchtime come around, and I'd just go to the bakery. There's a really good bakery in Berry, and they had vegan pasties back then, vegan pasties back in the 80s, uh, 90s, wow. back in the 90s and um, early 2000s. And, um, yeah, so I grabbed two pasties, um, vegan ones. But here's the thing, you know, one of those pasties are around about, you know, over a thousand calories just in one pasty and i'd put um all these you know tomato sauce on it then i get another iced coffee move a really big one <laughs> knock that down and um so i'd have that for lunch and then i'd come home late often you know nine o'clock at night and everyone's in bed my family's in bed so i would just order take out pizza i'll get a big vegetarian pizza because i've been vegetarian since 21 i've had no no animal products or eggs um, since 21, I just ate vegetables and dairy. And um, so I'd order a big family size pizza and I knocked that down. But I was starting to put on weight. And as I started to put on weight, I started to feel depressed. Not so much that I was putting on weight, it sort of didn't bother me. And I didn't really think I was that overweight. When you're overweight um, or obese, you actually don't, your mind tricks you and you don't think you are. And um, but I, I noticed I was getting depressed and it got pretty deep. I, um, yeah, some days I just wouldn't want to get out of bed. I'd pull the covers over my head. I'd cry a lot. And I didn't know what was happening. But um, I started to get this depression. When you're eating, okay, and when you are depressed, you want to eat more <laughs> to cover this yeah, emotion. Yeah. So I'd finish this big pizza and then I'd go to the freezer and I'd pull out a tub of ice cream, right? <laughs> and I'd sit there in front of the movie trying to chill out for the day and I'd just eat this tub of ice cream. And some mornings I'd literally wake up on the couch in the morning with this whole tub of ice cream on the floor, gone. Mm. Like, eat the whole damn thing. And, yeah, so that's, that was my lifestyle. However, I did eat a lot of fresh fruit and vegetables as well. I just had yeah. my fair share of junk food, like a lot of us do. We don't think that junk can affect us too much and a lot of that dairy can affect us too much but I I tell you it can it led to a heart attack yeah and now I know that you love your surfing were you able to fit in much activity at this time or were you just too busy with work yeah I was a really busy with work I used to surf every day since the day I was 12 since the age of 12 but um as I got busier as I got bigger I didn't surf as much either I guess I wasn't as fit right but one day a mate rings me and this is in 2009, so 10, 11 years ago, and I'm obese at this stage, right? And my mate rings me and says, Adam, the surf's going off. I'll meet you down in the car park in 15 minutes. I said, okay. I was nervous. I get down there and it's like 10 to 12 foot. He loves big waves. I used to love big waves, <laughs> not, not, not that obese. But anyway, he convinced me to go out. So he and I jump off this point. We paddle across to this break and I paddle into this first wave. And I surf a beautiful wave, pull off the wave. And then as I pull off, I'm looking out to the horizon and I see this massive set building. And I went, oh, my God, if I don't get over these, I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. I'm obese. I'm not very fit. If I get held down, it's like going to be it. So I start paddling like crazy, get over the first one, paddle, 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 get over the second one, paddle, 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 get over the third. And then there's this fourth and it's like a mountain. 
and I'm paddling up this thing. And just as I near the top, it starts to curl. That lip, yeah. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, this is it. It's over. But I got this strength, and I just did a couple of massive big strokes, and I just got through the lip, and bang, I got this pain right across my chest and down my left arm. I'm like, whoa, what was that? And I felt like it was like, you know, I'd pulled a muscle because I'd been paddling so hard. Mm. But I didn't know what it was, and I was still aching. So I went in, came home, and um, then all of a sudden all the symptoms of a heart attack happened. You know, I get this nausea, I get this cold sweat, um, I get really lightheaded, I got this pain down the left side and into my arm and shoulder blade, and I, I, I had no idea what heart attack symptoms were. I now know. Well, at <laughs> but, 39, you wouldn't be expecting it either, would you? Yeah, I wasn't, totally. And anyway, I knew I wasn't right, so I rang my wife and I said, look, someone's not right. She said, we'll get to the hospital, so I drove 30 minutes to the hospital. And I get in there, they put me, all these gadgets on me and take some blood. They come back a little while later and they say, Adam, you've had a heart attack. And I went, I don't think so. <laughs> number one, I'm 39. And number two, I'm a vegetarian and they're meant to have the lowest risk. And they say, Adam, we don't know about that, but you've had a heart attack, man. And that hit me. I went, whoa, like, how did that happen? Anyway, um. You know, they rush me. In. They fly me actually to Sydney um, from the south coast in a helicopter, and they rush me in, and you know, do an angiogram. And fortunately, where the tear happened was very low in the heart, and they weren't able to put a stint in. It was too the stints were too big to go where this was uh, into this um, into the heart. So I didn't get a stint, which I'm grateful for. Um, but I tell you, the um, after that, I was, they kept me in hospital for a little bit longer than normal. I think they kept me in a week instead of three days um, just to heal this tear. And But I felt super safe in um, in intensive care. Like these nurses, they were like, they, as soon as like I had a little murmur, they were there. <laughs> like yeah. I felt really, really safe. And they kept me in there. The food was actually good. I just asked for, you know, steamed veggies and beans and I got that. I didn't, you know... Um, you know, uh, yeah, I just kept it really simple and um, I got plenty of fruit and it was easy. And anyway, I left there and you leave with the five meds, right? And I take those religiously when I come home and and then a month later, you've got to go see your cardiologist. And um, I go see him and I walk in, he asks how I'm feeling. I said, look, I'm not feeling too good. I've sort of like lost my mojo like I'm feeling really flat um I just don't feel myself and and he said well the side effects of the meds but I got to tell you you're going to be on them for the rest of your life so you need to get used to it and I went whoa I don't think so so he and I like banded for a bit right and um and he said look Adam just take it for another month see how you go if you haven't settled into them I can give you some other meds that will help with the side effects, give you a bit of a boost. <laughs> and I went, man, okay. So I left there going, I don't want to live like this. There's got to be another way. So I Googled how to reverse heart disease with food. And all these plant-based doctors popped up like McDougall and Esselstyn and Dr. Clapper and you know, all these plant-based doctors. And I did the research on them. They have been treating patients for like 40 years on a whole food plant-based diet, reversing disease. And I went, wow, man, I'm almost there. Like, you know, they're saying get rid of the dairy. They're going to basically saying vegan but whole food. And I went, I could do this. Like, so I dished the oil. I went 100% whole food. And I put my chef skills together and um, started making these amazing dishes. And in a short period of time, I'm off all meds. And then I went off on to losing like, you know, 35 kilos, 30 kilos. And um, it's 35 kilos today that I've lost. But um, and and yeah, ended up doing an Ironman triathlon somehow in, in, that, <laughs> yeah. in the last 10 years. But it's been 10 years now. And I and yeah, I haven't had to take meds for like nine and a half years. And I've been able to maintain this healthy body weight for many years easily. And I feel the best I ever have, you know. It's like it just gets better the longer you eat this way. It just gets better and better. 
your skin gets better, your energy gets better. It's like you think clearer. Now, there's a lot of questions we want to ask here. There's a lot, but I just, but I just want to take a step back because yeah. this, this is, um, I guess, a lot of people will be asking this. Firstly, why were, why did you choose to go vegetarian when you did? You know, so approximately what twenty years ago, and especially as a chef working in a French restaurant where it is, or you know, we said cream and and butter, but a lot of meat, a lot of pork, of bacon, um, you know why you know was it what you were seeing and prepping or what's Good the question. story there yeah okay so i the reason why i went vegetarian was um it it wasn't so much the food actually what happened was on my 21st birthday it was a really big party. Now, this is 30 years ago, actually. I'm 50 now, okay? And I had the heart attack at 39. Um, so, um, but yeah, so when I was 21, my birthday party was huge. And I used to drink a lot. I started drinking when I was young, like 12, okay? Me and my mates would go and when I started year seven in high school, we'd start binge drinking on weekends. So, New South Wales, South Coast, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you get it, right? <laughs> um, surf and drink, right? Never got into drugs, which is pretty cool, but the drinking was big. So on my 21st, you imagine it was a big night, but something happened on that night that, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a great night. And at the end of the night, that's what happens when a lot of people get intoxicated. I used to... There's some people that when they drink get super happy, but some people when they drink go the other way and get a bit angry, right? Like it's I'm half Irish and the <laughs> Irish go one way or the other. And I'm the one that when I drink, I want to go punch people. Like And anyway, ended up um, in this fight on the night and it wasn't good. Anyway, the next day I woke up thinking, gosh, you know, I felt really bad about the evening and um, – you know those moments when you wake up and you go, you regret what you did the night before. Well, it was, a re- it was the worst one I've ever had. And and then um, what happened was, as a result of that, I went into a bit of a depression and I started drinking the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed every single day for about three months. And I actually put quite a bit of weight on. Mm-hmm. And I remember I was in a pub one night in the corner by myself drinking a schooner and being super paranoid. Like I felt everybody in the room was just talking about me and I couldn't escape it. Like I never felt it before. And, and I thought to myself, this is it. I'm out of here. I don't want to live anymore. Like I couldn't cope with the paranoia. And um, I remember thinking to myself, if I wake up in the morning and I'm still alive, I need to change my life. Anyway, I didn't try and commit suicide that night, thankfully, but um, I did wake up the next morning and I remember a book that someone had told me about called You Can Heal Your Life by Louise Hay. And I went and bought that book that day, took a month off work and I went through that whole book. And her book is mainly about, you know, focused on the body, the mind and the spirit. So I started that process and I saw a naturopath who started to treat the body and I was doing the affirmations in the book um, that Louise Hay was giving for the mind. Anyway, one day I'm with the naturopath and I said, look, I'm doing this book, you're doing my body, I'm doing the mind with the affirmations, but I grew up as a Catholic, you know, and that's all I know about spirituality. What do you know? (laughs) Because she's talking about this Eastern philosophy and things in this book. She goes, Adam, there's a whole bookshelf in my waiting room on Eastern philosophy. Just go pick one. And if you've got any questions about it, I'll, I'll chat with you about them and answer them. I went, okay, cool. So I picked one out. It was called Liberation of the Soul. And I read that book and it really resonated with me. And it was a meditation, a meditative path. And the foundation of that meditation path was um, a lacto-vegetarian diet, no drugs or alcohol, and live a pure moral life. Because those three things create the least amount of pain and suffering in the world. And it's easier to still the mind in meditation when you live that way. So I went, wow, I'm going to give this a go. And so, you know, Louise Hay and the naturopath got me to vegetarian. 
and I hadn't drunk either. So I thought, man, I'm going to keep going this way. I'm feeling pretty good. And I did. It was the best I felt in my life back then until now. And um, that's what got me on the path of going vegetarian. And, and I still follow that meditation today. I still meditate every single day, have for 30 years. Quite um, early in the morning too, I believe. Yeah, three or four o'clock for a couple of hours. But, um, um, but it still doesn't prevent you from having a heart attack, this pausing, right, this meditation. Mm. You've got to, you know, wellness is holistic. You've got to look after the body in regards to what you put in the mouth. The food is the foundation, mm. okay? And then you've got to make sure you are thinking clearer. But if you're eating a lot of process and junk food and a lot of dairy, you know, that affects the quality of the mind so you can think differently. Um, but, you, yeah, so it's a holistic thing. You've got to work on it all. And when I've always worked on it all, it felt really good. But then I got out of balance with um, working a lot. I was driven. Like I really wanted to be successful at something. And um, at that age you do, in your 20s to, you know, to 40s, you start wanting, that's, that's what drives you. And I wanted to. And I, I, I did achieve that. And once I achieved it, um, it, it was like, it was great for the moment. Yay! You know, I'd, I'd achieved the success in my career that I wanted. But then uh, a couple of weeks later, a month later, it's like, is this all there is? Yeah. And I went, yeah. maybe I had my ladder against the wrong wall because I don't feel very fulfilled. I felt great while I was building this business and career. But um, I got there and I went, man, this is it. And, you know, I was obese and had a heart attack. Yeah. It's, it's, it's you know, there's a lot of that I can relate to. I mean, I've, I come from a very sort of competitive and driven corporate background. You know, and, and I'm over that now for a lot of reasons. <laughs> but, um, you know, the whole concept of vegetarianism is is interesting because I, I, I don't know why I went vegetarian many years ago myself, but I also believe that was better for my health. Um, you know, it was kinder to the animals. I, I believed it was the right way to eat. And when you look at a lot of cultures, the question then is asked, well, is was vegetarianism then what we think vegetarianism is now, you know, was vegetarianism then maybe not veganism because the whole pescatarian, the whole dairy, all that crept in and, well, no, I'm still vegetarian, but I eat fish and I have dairy and I have eggs. So, you know, it's, it's, it's like you say, it's really interesting that you, 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 you thought you had the balance, you know, you were, you had, you lost that balance with the hours, stress, that kind of stuff. But in terms of what you were eating, you thought you were doing good, but, Two concepts: one, the process refinement of foods and so on, um, but also the fact that vegetarian food today still contains a lot of the animal products, such as dairy, eggs, and even fish. If you you know eat consuming fish, that can still cause a lot of harm and not necessarily cause, but not help undo the stresses that we're, we're getting from the other aspects of the lack of sleep, inactivity, and so on. So it's a real, it's a really interesting sort of concept to ponder and i know a lot of our listeners will be you know really fascinated with this little story of yours here yeah well the, the dairy is the big thing and that's the only thing i ate and i did eat my fair share of junk processed foods you know the refined sugars refined flowers the biscuits, oh, a tub of the ice cream as you told us a tub of ice cream yeah <laughs> so it's got the dairy yeah. in it but here's the thing with the dairy it's full of saturated fat mm. and the saturated fat is the thing that um you know, it raises cholesterol in the body. You know, there's many, many studies out there now that for over 40 years that prove that. And every cardiologist will tell you that as you increase your saturated, saturated fat intake, your cholesterol is more likely to go up. And if your cholesterol goes up, you are at more risk of having a heart attack. Now, I was eating bucket loads of it. And, now it's, yeah. and in the old days, like in India, the lacto-vegetarian diet was fine because um, – you know, the cows were treated differently back then to they mm. are now. It's all factory farm now. But the main reason the lacto-vegetarian diet is because some communities in India, they just didn't get enough calories. And if they didn't have a little bit of dairy, they just wouldn't get enough calories to be able to sustain themselves, right? So they had a cow. They could take a little bit from the cow and a few veggies and they had their lacto And a lot of their diet. dairy was in the form of ghee that was added to the dish. It wasn't the main component of their dish. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So all I did was take away the dairy, take away the processed foods and went whole food and even took away the oils, you know, because it's a refined 
it's a, it's a refined um, processed food. Oil's processed, right? Mm-hmm. Eat the whole olive or eat, you know, eat whatever, the, the avocado instead of the avocado oil. Um, I know there's other studies coming available now that, yeah. you know, it may be okay to have a little bit of oil. So um, I'm watching that. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. We all are. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's it's... Um, so I took those away, and it's amazing how the body can heal itself. Once you take away the things that are causing inflammation, the things that are causing the problem, which are those poisons, the meat, full of saturated fat, the animal proteins, above 5% of total calories. Um, once you take those things away, it's, we know that those things actually create inflammation in the body. And all disease is caused by inflammation. So you take that away, and then you've got to eat something. So you just eat whole plants the way nature gave it to you. And those things um, are (laughs) anti-inflammatory. So they reduce the inflammation and they're full of, you know, nutrients. So they actually heal the body. You know, they give the body the stuff that they need to repair. So people that eat this way 100% and they do it and they commit to it, they see results very quickly. Like, you know, we've got, I've got this program that I started because a lot of my friends came to me, Adam, and they said, Adam, how did you transform your health? You know, you know, I want to transform my life too. So I created this I Feel Good program and it's been going three years now and it's had thousands of people do it and the results are consistent. I get people to go to the doctors beforehand, they eat the food, and I get people to go after, um, they, after a month or six weeks or so, and it's consistent. Everyone that eats it, blood pressure drops, cholesterol comes down, blood sugars start to normalize, and um, people lose between two and 10 kilos, and they feel good, and they get this energy, and it's consistent. And as they continue on it, we've got people in there three years now. Um, everybody that has had type 2 diabetes in our program that have eaten it, at the 16 to 18 week mark, all of their doctors have said, you no longer have type two diabetes. And they've said, well, we're not gonna take you off all the meds yet. Let's see if you can, if it's sustainable. Let's go another three months and see what happens. They do that. And there's people in our program now, two years have not have, and have been off medications for type two diabetes for two years. Like we've had people with cholesterol at six and now it's like at 2.8 and 3.1s. By eating heart attack proof. Recently. Heart attack proof. Yeah, <laughs> under three point nine, right, Emma? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's pretty powerful way to eat, and I, you know, my mission is to to let as many people know as possible that they've got a choice. You know, yes, it's important to take the medications, and it's important to be monitored by monitored by your doctor and your healthcare professionals while you eat the food, and what happens is while you eat the food and your doctor's monitoring you, all your blood numbers are going to change. And as they change, they have to take you off the meds because um, it's dangerous to keep you on them. So that's how you get off meds. You just don't go and dump yourself off meds. You do it with your doctor, you eat the food, and everything changes. Yeah, I think that's a very important point. Yeah. Um, now, I want to quiz you a little bit on your program, but before we jump into that, a few other questions to unpack first. Um so you basically went cold tofurkey and switched your diet. <laughs> um, how quickly did you start seeing improvements and did you find it very difficult when you first made the little switch? Yeah. Um, yeah, from day one I went cold turkey. Was it difficult? Yeah, I craved. I craved all the sweet things that I used to love and eat, the salty things like the chips and stuff. And they were hard. So I created these little um, healthy, healthy type cakes and muffins and dessert things. So I'd make these um, muffins out of, you know, dates instead of sugar and pack them full of raspberries and blueberries and oats. I'd make it out of oat flour and stuff. So they're more dense and they're moist and soft. But, man, they got me through these things. And I'd go, I, I just got to eat ice cream right now. <laughs> and I could just grab one of these and I'd it helped me through it, you know. And then the chip stuff, you know, I made myself hummus um, and I would uh, get the wholemeal Lebanese bread and cut it up into sort of triangles and stick it in the oven and bake it so it's super crisp. And I dip that into 
into hummus and eat that to get a salty effect because, you know, hummus has a little, little bit of salt in it. Mine does anyway. Some some whole food plant bases would say <laughs> not put salt in. And um, so I, I do, I do, um, the, the, and carrots and celery sticks. Celery is really salty naturally. So I'd, I dipped that into hummus. That got me through the crunch and the salt. Yeah. And, yeah, so they're the sort of things I did. It was the get- And I think. I think that's really important too. That transitional phase is important because like a lot of people within the whole food plant-based community say this food is the best you'll ever taste. And it definitely is once your taste buds are used to eating that way. But if you take someone off a highly processed, hyper palatable kind of diet and you say, here, eat this bowl of steamed broccoli with no toppings whatsoever, that's not going to last for the person. <laughs> no, it's true. And, and it's true. And that's why, you know, I've made my program – um, it's palatable, but it still produces massive results. Yeah, absolutely. And what happens is people's palates change. Yeah, and they time. can change pretty quickly too. Really yeah, quick. Yeah. You just have to eat any food, um, you know, consistently for a few weeks and the palate creates an acquired taste to that. Like, you know, we had one lady who um, w- couldn't stand eating leafy greens, right? And I keep saying to her, where's the leafy greens <laughs> when she posts a pic? <laughs> I don't like them, Adam. I don't like them. Okay, let's do this. Let's do one leaf today. Tomorrow, let's do two leaves and let's do three leaves and let's see how it goes. Now, this lady, she like she's reversed heart disease, reversed type 2 diabetes, and um, she can't she craves leafy greens like she used to crave like chips right and she'll eat four cups of leafy greens easily she gets a craving she'll go and buy one of those bags of lettuces right mixed leaves and she'll start eating them like chips it's like that's what happens to people's palates it it will change if you stop the other food because the salty the fat fatness or fatty foods and the sweet foods those three are are so addictive on on the palate so once you you rid yourself of that or, yeah. or sort of transition, you, yeah. you get you, used to the normal levels. Yeah, and you appreciate then the actual flavors and and and, and of of real food. You know, you actually appreciate the taste of of the sweetness of natural sweetness of fruit. And yeah, I mean, real totally. food. Totally. Yeah, a hundred percent. You do. You make those. You can taste. You know, the sweetness in a sweet potato. You know, um, it's like, and even in even in lettuce. You know. An iceberg lettuce, you can actually taste a little sweetness in there as well. Yep. You can, yeah, once the palate gets back to clean, <laughs> to normal. <laughs> so you're eating the good food, you're starting to feel better, you're on the road to recovery, um, which is challenging enough, but obviously not as not enough for you. So let's talk about why you decided to do the Ironman. <laughs> That's what I was going to get on. <laughs> now for our listeners, for our listeners, an Ironman triathlon, a 3.8 kilometre swim, 180 kilometer cycle and yes just to finish it off a marathon 42.2 kilometers of running it's a nice little casual event (laughs) you go vegan you're weak you have no muscle because you're not eating protein (laughs) you're not your iron levels must be so poor how did you do it how did you do it (laughs) i have no idea man Because I used to have those worries, right, as well. Will I get enough protein? Will I get enough calcium, especially getting rid of the dairy? Um, but how, how it came about was this. As I, as I started to lose the weight from eating the plant-based diet, and I also got myself a little app called Couch to 5Ks. And while I was transitioning after the heart attack, because I said, Adam, you've got to move again. That's, a, that's the, you know, the thing that goes through anyone that's had a heart attack. They don't want to move again. Because you're scared you're going to have another one. Yeah. But they they said, Adam, you need to move and start the movement. Especially especially for you, the fear because you had that heart attack whilst out surfing. So mm-hmm. you don't you know the fear of overexerting yourself and bringing that strain back on. Totally. Mm. So um, so I started to lose a bit of weight doing the couch to five k's, which made it quite easier. And then my wife said to me, she goes, Adam, what do you want for Christmas this year? It's getting close to Chrissy, right? And I said, I want a bike. Um, she says, okay. I said, let's go get it now. <laughs> so I grabbed her and I take it down to the local bike shop in Berry, and I chose a bike. And um, so I started riding. I started riding on a Saturday morning with the bike shop, their ride. And we'd go out, do the ride, come back, and we'd all have coffee. And then <clears throat> I'm sitting there next to this guy one day, and he goes, Adam, a few of us are training for an Ironman. And um, 
a couple of us had done Kona and a few of us had done quite a few Ironman. We're going for a swim on Monday morning at the pool. Do you want to come with us and go for a swim? And I said, sure. Actually, swimming was one of my sports when I was a kid. And um, I said, yeah, I'd love to. So I went down there. And but I was overweight at this stage. I wasn't obese anymore. I was overweight. And um, so I went down and swam with him. And then he drove me. And as we're driving back, we're in the car. And I, say, I said to him, I said, look, um, you know, I told him I had had a heart attack, right, a, a couple of years earlier. And I was able to get off meds and I've got all this energy again. And he went, what? You had a heart attack? And you got off meds? And I went, yeah. He said, that's impossible. And I said, why do you say that? Are you a doctor or something? That's what <laughs> I did. He goes, actually, I am. I'm a GP, and I've never heard of it. Like, I've never seen it in my whole career, and I've been practicing, like, for 30 years, 40 years. And I went, well, you're looking at one right here. Anyway, it went dead quiet. <laughs> and I was like, it's dead quiet. I'm going, oh, my God, what's going to happen? So, anyway, then he turns to me and goes, Adam, I've just had this amazing idea. It would be super cool to take you from... MI, myocardial infarction, to I am, I am man. <laughs> and I went, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's for you guys. I'm nowhere near fit enough. I'll probably never be fit enough. And besides, I've had this heart attack, right? And he goes, Adam, I'm a doctor. I've done eight I men. If you really want to do this, I can train you to do it. And then I went, this opportunity is never going to come across my path ever again. I went, I'm in. So we did. We started training the next day, locked up at my house, and we started riding. And we trained for two years. It took me two years to get fit enough. Mind you, I still competed in the Ironman as an overweight. My healthy, you know, my healthy BMI is under 80 kilos. I did the Ironman at 83 or 84 kilos. So at that stage, it was five years after the heart attack, I was still overweight. And I couldn't shred that last bit to get in there, even training for an Ironman. Um, so, yeah, um, so we trained and trained and trained and, you know, I don't know, training for that, you know, we started out slow, we did 50K rides and um, I, he'd show up every day. If he didn't show up every day, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> but he'd show up every day and I would sit on his, you know, I'd sit on his wheel um, to get the draft and he slowly got me up to speed. And I just sat on his backside. That's how I got to an Ironman, sat on his wheel the whole time, and he just got me fit enough to do it. And I, and the runs, you know, we'd go for runs, and that was really tough, doing the runs and the swims. But, yeah, coming into the Ironman, we're doing, like, you know, 140K rides, 160K rides. and then, Running off the bike, that's an important one. Yeah, yeah, you know, we'd run off the bike and um, we'd swim and then jump on the bike and, you know, do 100 whatever the k's were i can't remember mm -hmm. i don't i don't i i've only been on the bike twice since the iron man <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know it's it, it was an interesting journey um i don't need to do it again um will i do it again i might one day um did but, you have to adjust your nutrition did you find you're going initially at the start when you're ramping up your hours and the mileage did you find that hang on you you're getting really hungry here you know you did you have to make a drastic change in terms of how much you were consuming? Were you making a specific effort to consume certain foods? Yeah. I probably could have done that a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. I had no idea what I was doing. And he wasn't – he was vegetarian, okay, okay. but he wasn't vegan. Yeah. He wasn't vegan. Yeah. And um, so I just ate what I normally ate, oats for breakfast, um, you know, before I go for I'd have a hit of, you know, a big bowl of oats or something. And then we'd take, um, I'd take some dates and things on the ride. Um, we got into the, I think we were using hammer, vegan hammer gel, bars and gels. As we got, I didn't do that in the early days, but as we got closer to mm. the event, started to take those. And, um, but I was hungry all the time. I never stopped eating. <laughs> like I'd come home for, coffee was great after a ride, right? or a training session, and then I would eat, eat all day. And I'd just eat, you know, I'd eat casseroles and curries and stir fries and um, soups. And I actually ate a lot of bread, actually. Um, yep. I, yep. Yeah, I'd eat a lot of toasties and burgers and buns. and um, So I wasn't really focused on it. I just ate. 
Yeah. You know, yeah. I had my tofu, I had my lit beans, um, I had my rice. Um, yeah, so I didn't really focus on that much. Yeah, I think a and common mistake, me, a common mistake for a lot of people is they don't eat enough, especially when they're plant based. So you know, that's that's a big lesson there. Well, it's true. You've got to eat a lot more calories. Um, yeah. I didn't get into it. I'm, I'm more into understanding calorie, um, you know, deficit and calorie um, enough calories to train these days because you know I do a bit of weights and things now. So I I, I got into that a bit. I wish I got into that when I was training. But yeah, you know, like nowadays, I I don't know how many calories I was eating when I was training, but it would have been a lot. <clears throat> um, but nowadays, you know, I do about 2,000 calories a day to 2,300 calories a day with the training I do. And I've still been able to maintain a really healthy body weight. Um, I don't know what an Ironman would need to really eat. I don't know. <laughs> a lot um, more. <laughs> I can tell you now. Yeah, 14, 16 hours of training a week. Yeah, yeah. your calories yeah. need to be up there. We're doing it, yeah. And I was, I was just, I had no idea how many calories I was doing. Yeah. But it did cost me not focusing on this in the right, in the uh, in the run, on the day. So we get the cans, and we, um, you know, the gun goes off, and dive in the water, and and did the three point eight k swim. And I got out of the water, and I think it was about an hour, and I don't know, an hour, an hour, just over an hour, an hour and five, or an hour. That's four good. That's that's <clears throat> sort of top yeah. top twenty five, top thirty percent. For I, was, sure. I was out. I was one of the f- first out of the water, you know. Nice. And I, my goal was to be out before, um, you know, the doctor that trained me, right? <laughs> so Usually at yes. Cairns, the, the goal is not to get eaten by the sharks or the crocodiles. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, true. Um, so anyway, I get out of the water. And I'm, I'm feeling good. You know, the old swim, the old muscle memory came back from being in the pool every day when I was a kid. So anyway, I hop on the bike and, you know, you ride from Cairns to Port Douglas and back. So I get on the road and I'm riding, riding and my goal was to beat, um, beat the guy that trained me. So I'm halfway, so I'm on, the, I'm on that road heading up there. It's beautiful, beautiful scenery, yeah. just bikes. I'm cruising along. And um, at about 40 or 50 k's up the, up the road, like, um, <laughs> he goes straight past me. <laughs> hey, Adam, I'll see you at the finish line. So <clears throat> I roll back into Cairns on, at six and a half hours on the dot, which I, we trained to. That was the, that's what we trained. So I get off the bike and um, I, hop, I start the run and it's through, uh, you know, through all the barricades where all the spectators are. And I'm about 200 metres in the run and I get these massive cramps in the gut. <laughs> like really bad mm. and I'm bent over and I go to the port and I'm in there for 20 minutes and it's not getting any better. It's getting worse and worse and worse and nothing's coming out. And I went, I'm out of here. Like I've got to bail. I've, I've got to quit and I'm not going to be able to finish this. So I come out and I'm looking <laughs> to find some medicos and get over these barriers. Right. And, and as I'm looking to get over the barrier, my mate who sold me the bike, who owns the bike shop in Berry, he'd done the half before us. And he's on the sideline and he goes, what's up? And I said, mate, I'm in so much pain. I've been in there for half an hour. I'm out. And he said, Adam, okay, we'll get you somebody. Hold on a sec. But before we do this, I want to remind you, this has been two years in the making to get you here. You only have 42 k's to go so sit down man, and chill it'll come good but at that moment i remembered well actually it was one of the biggest lessons of my life that you can't do things on your own you need a team you need a coach if paul wasn't there on that sideline there's no way i'd be talking to you right now because i would have walked off that course there's no doubt in my mind i was out but he was able to make a little switch in my head to get me to settle down and get me to sit and get me in the race. Now, if he wasn't there, that wouldn't have happened. So biggest lesson ever, you know, to have a team around you that can support you. So um, I sit down and about another 20 minutes later, it came good. And I got up and ran. <laughs> and I ran and I ran and I ran. And I got to the last eight Ks and every muscle in my body was aching. So I proudly walked that last eight Ks. And, um, but you get to the shoot, right? And it's the big arch at the end of it. I'm going, holy, 
holy, holy cow, I can't walk down that. That's a bit embarrassing, no, right? No, yeah. <laughs> so I jog, I'm doing the high fives all the way down and cross the finish line in 14 hours and 13 minutes and 36 seconds. A heart attack to Iron Man. But what was amazing, the doctor came in around about 12, 12 and a half hours and he waited for me and he's at the end of the finish line. And he gets this towel and wraps it around me and I fall into him and I just start to cry because from exhaustion. But not only that, <laughs> this guy had taken me from something that I thought was impossible to possible. And when you do something like that, it changes your mindset and your belief system that if I could do that, anything is possible, right? And he instilled that in me. And I've got the greatest respect and gratitude to him because he, he was the one that changed my life, really. If it wasn't for him, you know, I wouldn't have had that experience and know what the body's capable of. We have no idea what we're capable of. You know, we're just tapping, tapping it. We have so much potential um, and we have no idea how uh, the capacity of that. Talk about an inspiring story. Wow, that's, uh, that's definitely one of them. Thank you. <laughs> so you, you train you train triathletes right so how would you train me differently <laughs> uh, where will we start no look i think you know what's important is is um especially for a big event whether it's an iron an iron man an ultra marathon run um anything that that's really over and above you know a typical 10k half marathon is, is everyone's got a reason and everyone's got their own journey and um and just like you got reminded then while you're sitting outside this port is why are you here you know what was your reason for coming here and you've got to remind yourself that you are going to expect low points you are going to expect pain and difficulty and that's the whole point of a challenge and if it wasn't a challenge then crossing that finish line and you hear your name being called out saying Adam Guthrie, you are now an Iron Man. Yeah, I love that sound. Can I say something? Go for it. I the year before I went and watched my mates do it, right? Mm. I was actually booked in to the year before in Cairns, 2014. Right. But I actually I actually injured myself and I couldn't do it. Thank oh. God, because I wasn't ready. I had no idea what I was in for. <laughs> but the thing that got me to come back the next year was listening to that spruker when everyone crossed the line going and all I heard in my head was Adam Guthrie. You are an Iron Man, and I'm going, man, I can't wait to hear my voice like that. Am I, you know, my my name being called out like that? And that's what actually got me through yeah, to actually come yeah. back and start the training. So it's it's weird what keeps yeah. you there, right? <laughs> nah, phenomenal, phenomenal. But now yeah. that's but that's part of what you do now. I mean, you you're a wellness coach, you're a speaker, you're an inspirer. Um, you know, and and just listening to you now, I'm I'm feeling like. Damn, and here I was complaining earlier to Emma that my running this weekend was was pretty crap, and it's like, no, nah, come on, you know, <laughs> it's it's only to get out there and, and keep working. It's it's um so you know, tell us a little bit about now the work that you do, and and you know, you've gone through your personal journey, and and you just want to help people. Yeah, yeah. What's what's driving me, and what my mission is now is that you know I wasn't given the choice of a whole food plant based diet or medications, right? And it's wrong that we're not given that choice because it's so powerful. Mm. And I just want to let everybody know that you've got a choice. You can, you know, adopt a whole food plant-based diet and it's going to give you the best chance of recovering from these lifestyle diseases while you're being monitored by your doctors. Um, and I just want as many people to know as possible to feel good, <laughs> to know what it feels like to actually feel good and be healthy because it's amazing. And so, you know, like I said, a few of my mates came to me afterwards and said, Adam, you know, you turned your life around. How did you do that? We want to turn ours around as well. So I created, I said, the best way to do that, I'll teach you to do it. So we created this four week program, which is now a year program. Because what happens when I first started creating this program, which teaches people, you know, it gives people a meal plan, it gives them a shopping list, it gives them recipes. Um, it has, you know, weekly coaching calls and weekly cooking classes, and it's got daily Q and A's in it. So there's a lot of support, um, but we give it, give everybody um, all the tools, and they just have to go buy the food, chop it up, cook it, eat it, right? Make it really easy for them. So we did that for a four or five week program, 
and it was great. Everyone got all these amazing results and felt great. Um, but then what happens is people drop the ball afterwards and then they don't pick it back up and they go back into their own habit. So I thought I did some research on habit change and a month's not enough, right? Correct. So, um, and part of the learning curve is this, you get excited, enthusiastic at the start, you do this, you can hold it, but then you drop the ball. Mm. And then what most people do, they walk away and don't pick it back up. But in a, any any sort of, you know, ball game that requires you to hold a ball, um, when you drop it, what do you do? You pick it straight back up and keep heading towards the goal, the try line, right? So what I realized that this nor- this is part of the learning curve. You drop it, but then you need a bit of support to pick it back up. And you pick it back up, and then it'll take you to another level. And then you'll drop it again. And you'll pick it back up and go to another level and you drop it again. And then over a year, over six months, over a quarter and further out, you start here and you go here. But now you've got habit change. And that's why we're seeing people now can live this lifestyle just like it's normal, just like it is for me. This is just the only way I eat, right? So um, I changed the program to a year to help people through that. And people do. They drop it. They come back in and it allows them to keep going. And... So, yeah, I created that and I wanted it to be as easy as possible for people. So, um, you know, because when you do start this way, it's a big change. It's not how you're normally eating. You get a lot of hassle from family and friends and they're all concerned that you're not going to get, it's not the right way to eat, you know, and you're going to die if you don't have protein from animals and So we teach them, give them support, give everybody support on how to deal with family members, how to eat this way if nobody else in your family wants to, but you do. One of the tips I give is this. You make the whole food plant-based meal, right? And that's the vegetable dish for the night. And then what you do, if your others want, if they want meat, you know, they can cook it off or you could cook it off for them. Just grill the piece of meat and then chop it up. So you've got a curry, for example. It's a veggie curry. They put both bowls, the curry on the table and the bowl of meat on the table. You take your curry, vegetable curry, they take the veggie curry and add the meat to it. You know, or if you've got steamed vegetables or whatever, you take your legumes and steamed veggies, they take the meat and free veg. Like it's it's one of the easiest ways to do it and everyone's yeah. happy. So we teach people that. We teach people how to eat out socially, how to eat, you know, um, when they're traveling, all the things that could stop people from doing it because all those things are hard until you learn how to do it it's like when you start anything like it's always hard when you first it's changing a habit it's changing Changing a habit so we support people really well in that and the results have been incredible and i'm extremely um, proud of everybody that's um, been through the program and the results they're getting they're like literally what touches me the most is when you hear stories of you know one lady for example she couldn't walk to the letterbox. She was obese. She was had a really bad magnesium deficiency where her skin was all red and it would tear and um, um, and she had heart disease and type 2 diabetes. She'd almost have a heart attack walking to the letterbox and hurt her feet and all this sort of stuff. Now this woman, okay, does 10,000 steps a day easily. She goes on all these trips where she climbs mountains, goes to Antarctica and walks on ice with penguins. You know, she, like a whole world has changed. Yeah. She can live life with energy. And that's what we're seeing. People that didn't have energy, that were couch potatoes like me, I was like a car seat potato and an office desk potato, um, that now have energy to be able to enjoy life. And it's yeah. super powerful. And you, we're getting a whole range of different people now. Like, you know, it's people that were sick before, but it's now younger people who are wanting to have more energy. And they're wanting to eat this way because, you know, they care about the environment or whatever, you know. Um, but they're wanting to, they're looking at prevention as opposed to, like they've seen their parents with a heart disease or die, which is really sad from some of these diseases. And they don't want that to happen. So they're making a switch. So it's really nice to see an incredible community and a mix of people. It's mainly ladies, though. Mainly ladies. <laughs> Not many men in there yet. That's because we're smart, you know. <laughs> yeah, you guys, you girls are on it, right? I th- I, but but you know, it's that's the problem, though, and and you see it, you see it in a lot of 
different facets of exercising and nutrition and so on is is women uh, men are always wait until there's something wrong men wait until there's something that needs to be fixed so for men it's until they have a heart attack until they've been diagnosed with diabetes or or you know a health ailment and unfortunately it's happening earlier too whereas women i think just have this natural um Actually, I'm speaking on behalf of you, Emma, but, you know, I think <laughs> w- w- you, Emma? <laughs> w- women tend to be a bit more conscious of the bigger picture. And, you know, for them, it's not just waiting until there's there's a problem. It's, well, hang on. What if there's a problem? I don't want that problem. So let's think about what I always talk about, especially in sport, is longevity. Yeah, it is. But, yeah, it's the way it is. So um, we just well, work with people that want to be worked oh, with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, you can't change someone that doesn't want to be changed i mean you can plant that seed but yeah until they're ready yeah that's true i think it's really great though that you're starting to have a younger demographic come through the course because as you said like more and more people are wanting to go plant-based for the environment and for ethical reasons um and it's really important that you're educating them on the benefits of whole food plant-based because right now we have so many more options than we used to with all this processed vegan food um and they're not necessarily great for us so it's really good that you're you know (laughs) educating on this yeah, that those um yeah the vegan processed foods. You know, I still have those if I go out. If I go out, like I went to a place, a ramen place the other night, and I had some of that fake meat in it, and I have that, but it's it's very rare, right? It's like yeah. um the um yeah at home it's just always a hundred percent whole food plant based, and it works. And it's important to make it practical. You know, there's so much science out there on the nutrition. Um, in the program, I have it at a very high level. Like this is where, you know, plants have protein, <laughs> you know, all plants have protein and we look at that, but you know, Emma, you've helped me, like we've done a meal plan together, um, for the program, which, you know, I wanted to create one that met the Australian government guidelines on nutrition, which is different to the whole food plant based guidelines it has a little bit more fat in it. And, you know, we give that to people if they want to have that one. The other one is, you know, it's, it's a slightly little bit more fat in it than um, yeah, the one that everyone goes through. It's around about sits around about eighteen percent or sixteen or eighteen percent fat, um, as opposed to ten percent that whole food plant based. But what's really interesting, you know, you're still seeing these results of that. And I start the question: Well, what's the upper limit of plant based fat where these diseases don't happen? And because you're seeing people reversing disease at that level, not ten percent. And I asked my mate Simon. Um, he, you know, plant proof. And he said, Adam, there's, there's been no studies done on the upper limit. Um, but he said, you know, the 10% that was, um, that 10% level was set by Ornish in his study. But he said, when you go and look at the study, um, hardly anyone could adhere to it. Everyone was sitting in, it averaged at 18% fat is what everyone adhered to. And they still got these benefits. So it's quite interesting, right? Um, and so I just teach people at a high level. I don't go into it. I send people to doctors and nutritionists and things like that. Um, but I just give them the practical skills. How do you actually make this practical? Because nothing changed. You can have all the knowledge. You can read every scientific paper. You can, you know, um, read every book, look at every documentary. But until you pick up the food and stick it in your mouth, yeah. nothing, nothing changes. Yep. It only changes when you put the food in the mouth and then it all changes. And people don't want to go back because they start to feel so good, right? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So we can get caught up in this analysing and more information and it's really simple. There's only two questions. I developed two questions, two questions to determine whether I put something in my mouth. Do you want to know what they are, guys? <laughs> yeah. I, I teach this to everyone now because everyone comes to me and says, Adam, is this any good? Oh, do you think I could have this? Or is this good? Or is this good? You know, that sort of thing. Everyone's confused. What's healthy and what's not? So I said, there's only two questions. The first question is this. First of all, if you get two yeses to these questions, it's good. It's whole food plant-based. So first question, is it a plant? Okay. If it's a yes... You move on to question two. If it's a no, you don't eat it. I don't eat it. Me personally, in the conversation, I just don't put it in my mouth because it's an animal product. Question two, if it is a plant, is, is it in the form nature gave it to me? 
So Oreos, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, then you've got a decision to make. Do you want to put the Oreos in or not? They are a plan, but will are they the best thing for you to transform your health? Maybe yeah. not the best, but every now and then people have them. Um, I've been known to have them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I've um, – yeah, so the question is, you know, if it's in the form, you've got two yeses, that's all you need to know. Nature hasn't got it wrong. Just eat it. I use those same two questions. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Nice and simple. Yeah. Good on you. I think, I think that's that's the important <laughs> lesson that, you know, I always, um, you know, my presentations always get to a point and then I put up a, a, an image of a, a burger with cheese and the fries and everything. I say, right, this is fully vegan. But what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> you know, and it's everything, the saturated fat, the salt, the oils. The... So it's exactly what you say. It's, it's you know, and, and people that go, let's say vegan rather than whole food plant-based, but go vegan for ethical reasons or the environment, that's great. They're making an impact, but they're not making an impact on their health. And from a health perspective, you know, we talk about how much fat should we, shouldn't we have. But I think a big, big component of going whole food plant-based is the fiber. And I think the fibers are very, very big component of that, that difference between eating yeah. less plants and eating more plants that's less processed. Because again, like the Oreos might be plant derived, or you can have your plant based protein powders and all that kind of stuff, but the fiber, the fiber that's missing all the micronutrients as well. So, you know. 100% agree, you know. Um, it's, you know, to give you an idea of what I eat now, I, I termed an I feel good plate, right? I call it the I feel good plate or the I feel good bowl. And it's so important to, it, it's a great visual to see if you've got the right things on there, right? Mm. So what I do is half that plate, I call them high water content vegetables, okay? And that's everything that grows above the ground um, that's, you know, a fruit or a berry or leafy greens or a broccoli or cauliflower. Anything that grows above the ground that's not a nut seed, right, yeah? or a legume that's dried, right? Yeah. So um, half the plate, fill it with that. It's going to give you loads of fibre and it's going to give you a lot of those um, micronutrients as well. And then on the other half of the plate have the starches, what I call the starches, and there's three types of starches. There's the root vegetables like potatoes and sweet potatoes. Um, there's the legumes which are the beans and the chickpeas and the lentils. And then there's the um, grains. So you get the rice and the oats. Now you can have all three of those starches on there or you can just have one of those starches. Um, if you have one of those starches, make sure you have a different one the next day so you get mm. variety. Mm. So, and then one tablespoon of whole food fats on top. So I get a tablespoon of avo or make some cashew sour cream, which I love, and put a dollop of that on there with some lemon juice and you know, um, and you've got an incredible bowl of food, right? Now, that bowl, that's the simplest version, but you can make a curry, you can make a casserole, you can make a stir-fry based on those principles. And yeah. if you make a bowl like that, you're going to have super health. Is that right, Emma? Yep. Tick, big tick. I agree. Tick. <laughs> and I tell you, you yeah, you're going to get the fibre, and that's what the thing makes you full, right? And that's the other thing. People say, Adam... Like they get worried about how much they're eating <laughs> because it's about 1,800 calories, right, um, in our meal plans. And, and because there's a lot of fiber, it's bulky, and they go, Adam, I've never eaten so much in my life. Mm -hmm. I've just lost 10 kilos. How does that happen? That's because, you know, it's high in vol volume and it's super low in calories. You know, and that's the, that's the trick to a plant-based diet is you eat a plate like that, you're going to get – See, I can have my burrito bowl, which is around about 350, 400 calories, or I could have three tablespoons of olive oil. Yeah. Or you can have yeah. both <laughs> when have you both, eat out. And I've got a, then I've got a 750, yeah. 800 calorie but, but, bowl. But, that, but that's what we're typically eating because you're having, yeah. you know, oh, but this is healthy. It's beans and it's this and that, but it's been cooked in a lot of oil. It's been fried and so on. So you're doubling up. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's, that's where a big sort of challenges with with society you know there's a lot of vegan options eating out um but like we say you know great for the environment great for ethics but you're still loading up the calories and probably too much saturated fat amongst other things so totally and mm. you know coming back to that you know the ethics and for caring for animals and the environment you know all of those reasons i'm i'm vegan for as well right um the thing is though that i think 
when we only focus on that, like we're a human too. We're an animal as well. Yeah. And we need to look after ourselves. We need to care for ourselves. And if we don't care for ourselves primarily by, you know, ditching that junk food and eating the whole plants, we won't have the energy to be able to make an impact 100%. Exactly. on the yeah. environment yeah. or the animals. Yeah. yeah. So anyone that's out there going, yeah, I'm vegan for this, but you're still eating the junk and you're sick, you know, it could yeah. be a wake-up call that we need to look after us as well, otherwise we won't be able to help anybody. Exactly. And one of the most effective forms of advocacy is to show people that you can be healthy and vibrant and strong eating this way because then they'll want to eat that way too. Like no one's going to change to a vegan diet if we're all sick and nutrient deficient. No, you're spot on, Emma, and you see it in our program, right? Like no one in the family wants to eat this way, but as soon as the person that committed to doing it starts to produce results after a few months, everyone's going, hmm, maybe that stuff mum's making is pretty good. Or maybe that stuff my wife, I might try it out. And so many men now, after a year, eat this way because they've seen the difference. And friends have seen, noticed the difference and then they start asking questions. What are you doing? You look amazing. You know, look at your skin. Do you really want to know? <laughs> <laughs> I eat plants. <laughs> you know, that's what happens to everyone in the program and that's the biggest way to to like you say Emma it's the biggest impact that you can have to influence someone to come this way is to produce results yourself you can talk but if you don't look it people are going yeah whatever but if you look really good and they've seen the change they're going to get interested yeah 100% yeah yeah so look I know that well being involved in your program before and you know taking a peek peek behind the curtain to see what you do offer it's phenomenal and you're on tap to everyone, so you're just insanely busy. I don't know how you have time to sleep, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but you offer so much positivity. You offer so much support. Um, future plans? Where's Where's this all headed? Ah, where's it headed? Um, Iron Man number two. <laughs> nah. no, six pack abs, though. I've never yeah. had a six pack. So the six, I'm working on the six pack now. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but but. What I want to do, we want to, I want to help more and more people. Um, the I Feel Good book will be coming. I'm going to do a series of books. Uh, we're going to um, we're going to create a number of other courses as well that people can just tap into um, rather than do a whole program if someone wants to go to the next level with something or, you know, tip their toe into the water. Um, we're going to create a series of other little mini courses for people to experience this way of eating. And um, pre-made meals may be coming. Ooh. <laughs> We're starting next week at the our, my local cafe here in Byron Bay called The General, the, uh, Byron, Bay, the Byron General Store. The guys that own that are mates and we got talking one day and they said, Adam, we'll, like, we can't open at night. Can you make us like some of your food and just – package it up so people could take it home. Mm-hmm. So we're actually going to start that next week there. But I've been in touch with um, some other people that um, can make it en masse and distribute it around Australia. I don't like, – I should probably talk a bit early on that, but um, we'll see where that heads. So I think it's it quite may, a burrito. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's definitely happened at the Jenny, at the general store. Excellent. Well, there, there's a good reason for me to come back and visit uh, Byron <laughs> Bay when – well, when, when we can again. Um, Adam, thank you so, so much. It's been an absolutely enlightening uh, conversation. Um, we, I think we've been laughing, we've been smiling, we've needed this. Um, but it's, it's certainly the inspiration part, it's, it's um, you know, usually we say you're never too old, but in this case, you're never too young to make the right change. And, um, you know, it's important that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of good stories come from someone that's experienced something but we don't need that. It's start now, make the impact, look after your health, look after your lifestyle. But the changes you've made and what you've achieved and what you're going to continue to achieve is, is just, it's, it's really inspiring us to get up and move um, and be more mindful of what we put in our mouths as well. So thank you so much for sharing your passion, your story, and uh, we look forward to continuing to following your amazing journey and successes. 
And speaking of following, just before we sign off, make sure you follow Adam on social media. He posts some delicious recipes <laughs> um, and check out his program. Yep. So Adam Guthrie on Adam Guthrie on Instagram. Yep. And you can go to ifeelgood.com.au. And there's a free there's a free course on there. There used to be the tour I did. You know, I used to do these tours before shutdown happened where I do a three-hour course and a bit of a cooking class. Um, we recorded that. So it, it'll inspire you to eat this way. So go and check that out. It's free on my website. So, um, right. yeah. And one other thing that we're going to do, we're going to create meal, more meal plans. So hopefully, Emma, you'll help me with these. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. You're in? <laughs> yeah, definitely. So get that, all the nutrients right. So, guys, thank you so much for having a chat with me. I've really enjoyed this chat. It's, it's been good. great. You Appreciate guys are doing great work. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks, Adam. Bringing, bringing the message to more and more people. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Lentil Intervention Podcast. If you found this interesting, make sure you subscribe and share it with your friends.